What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade, and not just any episode. This is episode 100 of the show, and uh, I can hardly believe that I'm able to say that. I really just want to thank you guys for staying here, listening to the show, and um, all of that kind of stuff. It's just been so encouraging getting messages from you guys, just knowing that you're showing up every week and listening to the podcast. And so thank you guys for all of your support. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being there. And um, hopefully I can give you a good episode this week to make it worth your while. And uh, hopefully this podcast will continue to go on from strength to strength. I certainly have the um, motivation to keep it going because I really enjoy doing this. So last week we were speaking with Shane Fleming. Shane Fleming is an Irish property agent, but he's based in New York City. Uh, That was episode 99, if you're interested. This week, I'm going to be going into the top five trends that I believe are shaping or impacting the real estate sector in 2022. And probably, let's be honest, probably going to impact 2023 as well. Many investors, and even if you're not an investor, if you're a wannabe investor, somebody who is interested in getting into this whole sector, you will be wondering where should you be looking, where should you be kind of focusing, where should you be studying. And um, if you ever want to kind of get successful at something, you shouldn't be looking at where everybody's looking at. You should be looking at where everybody's going to be looking at in the future. And so that's why I kind of pay a close attention to trends. And let's use that old Wayne Gretzky. Wayne Gretzky, by the way, I think he's a Canadian ice skater. And he had this, uh, was asked about like, how is he so successful? He just said, I don't skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going to be. And I think that's the kind of the moral of it. So that's going to be my focus today. Hopefully it's going to help you guys find which trends you should be looking at going forward. And this is my own personal opinion of those trends. Other people may differ. Um, As always, quick reminder, uh, just that this episode uh, with the last couple of episodes is now on YouTube, live video. So if you want to watch rather than listen to this, just head over to the uh, YouTube channel. It's called Behind the Facade Real Estate and Property Investment Podcast. (laughs) A bit of a mouthful, but um, that's where you'll find it. And uh, if you want to go over there, please do subscribe to the channel. All right, look guys, that's enough of an intro. Let's get into the show. You are listening to Behind the Facade and I am your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. Okay, guys, here we are, episode 100. Let's make it a special one. Today, I'm talking about the top five trends that are shaping real estate in 2022. Now, before I jump into the main topic, I just want to quickly do one or two things. First of all, quick shout out to Ross. Now, Ross sent me a message during the week and he just said that he thought it was nice that I talked about Ukraine and that a lot of people are kind of pretending like it's not existing. Um, I'm very focused on Ukraine, as you know, because my wife is from Moldova, which is right next door to Ukraine. And there is something like 250,000 refugees poured into Moldova. So, you know, that is more than 10% of their population. Now, we are seeing an influx in our own country here in Ireland. And if you're listening to the UK, I know there's an increase there too. Um, Also, I wanted to quickly remind you guys that I have just relaunched my property training, uh, property education programs. I have completely restructured and updated them. I've gone from being a 12 month thing right down to a six month. And I also have a six week option, which is for people that are kind of really starting out. So look, if you're interested in that information, please send me a DM or you know find me on LinkedIn or whatever. Also, I wanted to just give you guys a quick, you know, just a warning, I guess, to watch out for fraudsters out there. Now, if you, 
are a longtime listener of the show. You may remember I talked about this last year. Somebody contacted me and asked me about his investment, and I had no idea what he was talking about. And it turned out that somebody had created a fake website and was impersonating me and actually had gone out there and sold this guy on some investment and like literally scammed him out of you know tens of thousands of dollars i think he was from australia so uh just this week i've been contacted by somebody else and in on, on this occasion it's a private investigator and he is researching a possible scam now when he asked me about it I was kind of like, what are you talking about? And then he showed me this, uh, this website and it has an address with East Point as the, uh, as the address. And he asked me, was this business located in East Point? And could I confirm the business was located in East Point? And immediately, just immediately knew that is not anything to do with East Point because I send out invoices every quarter to all of the occupiers in East Point and I've never, ever seen this company's name. In addition to that, I know exactly who occupies the building that this you know, was actually using as an address. And then I read that in his, his investigation email, he said that this was a crypto investment opportunity. And then I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> there you go. That's all you need to hear. So you just got to be aware, guys, uh, and I'm sure many of you are already very, very, you know, up on all this. But for anyone who's just not aware, the, 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 the tricks of this whole trade, I guess, or the scam is to use some genuine stuff and then to slip it in, you know, um, original documents and stuff. So what this these people have done is they've used a, a genuine address that gives it that lends it credibility. So East Point being a business park and all that makes it look like a real business. Second of all, they're putting in these official company registration documents. Now, that does not mean that your money is in this company. All it means is that what they've done is they've created a company and they have a paper trail to this like entity. But these guys create like fake websites. And like we had a genuine company that had no website. And these guys created a website that actually was impersonating it. So just because you see real documents and stuff like that does not mean that that's actually where your money is physically going. Now, this website uh, that I saw also had photographs of um, people that worked in this so-called company. Um, now, funnily, curiously, they all had masks on. And of course, because we're in a time with COVID, having a face mask on in a photograph looks perfectly legit. But I actually suspect it's there in order to protect their identity. And lastly, they put photographs up of the building that was so-called here in East Point at the address um, that I, you know, I know all of these buildings very well. I built most of them and the photos were not of the um, uh, of the building at all. They were from some totally other place. I have no idea what building it was, but it was not here in this park. Um, this this business even had its own YouTube channel, Facebook group. Uh, Instagram like these guys go to a lot of trouble and they put it out there and you go and it all looks legit and they go out there and um, they scam people and then after a while you realize where's my money gone and suddenly it's all gone and you can't find it any longer so um, these guys were trying tr trying too hard in my opinion like when I saw company documents like up on the website and stuff but to people who are on the other side of the world um, they often don't, you know, they, they see these kind of things and they check it out online and they, they kind of think, oh, this must be legit if I can see it in the company's office or something like that. The last thing just to mention on that is that usually these are investments that are, you know, they're, they're basically catching your attention because of huge returns. And everyone knows crypto has the ability to make a huge return. So if you're sort of thinking that you could make a, you know, a 200% or 500 or 12,000% increase in your investment that makes you greedy. And they kind of use these pressure techniques like invest, you know, you've got, you know, 12 hours to invest or else you're going to be, you know, it's going to be oversubscribed and you're not going to be able to get your money into the deal. And if you're thinking that if I put 10,000 in, that could be worth 2 million, you know, in, in, in a matter of weeks, 
of course you feel like you don't miss out on that opportunity. So you do your research and you find, oh, wow, it is a real company. It's based in Dublin. It's in this big office park. It must be legit. Look, here's photographs of people working in that office. Oh, look, it has name badges like out on the street and stuff. It must be real. And you don't have enough time to go and do proper research to kind of figure it out. But there's just enough there to kind of give it credibility. And that's how they get you. So just... Be aware of that, guys. The more and more people contact me on this kind of stuff, the more I kind of think, geez, you just have to be so careful. It's so easy for them to sort of get you. And they can even, I'm getting text messages nowadays from things like the post office and from certain banks and stuff. And I see the message and I know it's fake, but it is coming from the actual phone number of the post office or the bank or whatever. And that is because they can now mask these phone numbers. They can actually give the phone number of the actual bank. So it's not coming from somebody's mobile, it's coming, they're able to basically assign the number that they want it to look like it's coming from. And so huge amount of scams going on out there, guys. The final thing before we get into today's topic is that I've actually gone out and I have created what I am calling the property investor readiness test. Now this is a questionnaire, it features 20 questions and it's just questions that I've kind of devised just give me an idea of whether or not you're knowledgeable about property or not. And the idea of doing this test, it's completely free, by the way, and there's going to be links in the show notes. Just click on it and it'll ask you 20 questions. It takes no more than four minutes to do this. And at the end, you're going to get a result and the result will just tell you whether or not you are an expert or intermediate or kind of at a novice level. It just depends on the, the answers that you give go and check that out. The link is below. It's called the Property Investor Readiness Test. And um, it's just a little curiosity. You guys might be interested to learn more. Right, so let's get into the main topic today. Top five trends shaping real estate in 2022. So whenever you're looking ahead at trends and at kind of predictions going into the future, it's always a good idea to actually turn around and look backwards. And um, what I mean by that is look at where the money and capital has been flowing to date. And um, that is where the focus of investors has been in the past. And if you do that, I mean, if you, let's just take the immediate time frame that we're in at the moment. We're just coming out of, looks like we're coming out of, and hopefully we are coming out of two years of the COVID pandemic. And it has turned some markets completely upside down and on their head. But if you were an investor during that period of time, you would have made a lot of money in three particular areas. I call them the three L's, or certainly that's the, the name that I'm giving them now. We all like to have these little things. Um, the three L's are living, as in residential. Uh, logistics as in warehousing and storage and facilities and things like that and then life sciences now life sciences is a kind of a new category and it is basically these companies that are involved in health monitoring health data big data around health and stuff and the people the companies that the corporations that created say the va the vaccines and that do all of the medical research and stuff that's life sciences and those are not just businesses with off needing offices and stuff and factories and warehouses they actually also need laboratories and stuff so they've given it a name life sciences those are the three living logistics and life sciences um the other one that a lot of money has been pouring into has been data centers and that is of course because everyone knows the cloud is becoming the big thing where everything is stored you no longer use kind of physical hard uh, drive backups and any longer you really put everything on the cloud. So they need huge amounts of data centers out there. And so that has been, those have been the four principal areas where people have been investing. And because those are the areas that have got all the money, they have basically all risen up, you know, dramatically in price over the time. And because of that, we are in a situation where a lot of investors are now looking at other sectors that are looking cheap by comparison. And they're starting to kind of suspect that there may be a bounce in those other sectors that suffered. So let us look at the, the sectors that suffered. There's now conviction is the big word. There's now conviction that there's going to be value to be got by investing in offices, 
retail or hotels. Those are the, the three main kind of sectors that got hit during the pandemic. Now, whilst I agree, you know, that that's probably correct, it is a bit broad just to kind of look at those and sort of say that, that that's not a trend as far as I'm concerned. And not everyone has a couple of mil lying around to kind of invest in a hotel or whatever it is. So I thought what I'll do is I'll have a look at the specific trends that I am dealing with myself, that I'm kind of seeing, that I'm having to educate myself on and, and trying to learn on the job, so to speak. And um, it's most of the stuff they're going to be talking about is in the commercial space where I operate. Um, I, I, you know, I run a business park and I have lots of offices that I have to kind of look after. And because of that, um, I see a lot more of that kind of stuff. But also we're in the process of building residential units um, here in Dublin. So I have some view of the residential market. And I'm also working with my mastermind clients and, um, and so I'm getting kind of feedback from them as to what they're looking at. And so I do have a few from the residential sector as well. So the five that I'm going to be talking about are flex offices, ESG or sustainability or the green agenda, we'll say, big data and the harvesting of information, wellness as in health and fitness, and then residential HMO and HMO being house of multiple occupants. Breaking it down into the specific, by the way, those are not stack ranked. I mean, it's not number one is flex offices. This is just the, the top five that I see in any order. But starting with number one, with the flex offices, everybody's familiar with WeWork and the whole co-working trend that has been taking off in the last couple of years. And you could say that that is flex, but actually flex is a little bit more because there's a new attitude towards it from the actual landlords themselves. Now, in the past, the landlords would have no more than like maybe 5% um, allocated to flexible kind of options and stuff like that. But the new sort of industry numbers that I'm starting to see is that that is heading for 15 to 20%. Now, the traditional landlord, if you go back in the past, and I would say that, you know, traditionally, the business I'm in would have been like this as well, is that you'd build a building, you'd lease it up for a long-term lease. It used to be 25 and 35-year leases. Those, are, those days are gone. But the idea was you lease it up and you just forget about it. On, you just collect the rent every quarter and that's it. Those days are over. Now that we have hybrid offices and work from home and all that, there's fewer staff coming into the office. Um, when they do come in, they're only coming in for like two days or three days a week. They're working at home for a couple of days. And this has resulted in quite a transformation in the industry, in, in the sector. Now, it's not a complete close down of offices by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, office corporations need offices for things like collaboration, bringing the staff together, the community, the atmosphere that they feel of being together. So I do see offices continuing. But because there's fewer staff coming in, because people are working so many days a week from home or whatever, there's definitely a reduction in the amount of space that people require at the moment. And that's certainly what we're seeing. And in a couple of cases, I've actually seen up to 50% of the amount of office that they had pre-COVID being handed back to us and um, asking, can we take it back? Some landlords will resist that and they'll just look for somebody to come along and take the entire. What I've looked at is actually going with the flow and saying, yeah, sure, we'll take back half of that floor. We'll split the floor and we'll rent out the other section that you don't want and let you guys stay. Rather than lose the tenant, we'd rather retain them and work with them. But it is expensive to do that split and to do that reduction. And it's actually, it's something that I've been dealing with lately. It's quite a complex job. It's not just a matter of build up a partition. It has to be a fire partition, needs to have fire doors and separation and all that. And then all of the services that go on above the ceiling and below the sort of raised floor, all of that needs to be specifically designed to go into each compartment, we'll say, in each fire compartment. Now, I've been working on this and it is not a straightforward at all. So definitely in terms of what I've seen and in terms of the workload that's involved, I can see why landlords would avoid it. And I can see why from an occupier's point of view, it might be an awful lot easier and more convenient just to move into a flexible offering 
that one of these kind of WeWork type places are doing. However, certainly here in the Dublin market, I am seeing poor choices in that regard. Now, I, I know that that's poor choices because I have met with some of these occupiers and they've asked me to meet them and show them some of the spaces that we have. And the feedback I'm getting from them is that they've looked at the, the likes of WeWork and stuff like that, the options that are out there, and they do not like them at all. First of all, they're very expensive, but second of all, they're quite small and their own word in, in their own words, they're kind of pokey and um, you know, desks are kind of crammed together and stuff. And they did not think that, that, you know, these guys are coming from spacious offices. They don't want to be crammed into a place like that. So certainly at the moment the offering is quite poor. And um that makes that makes me think that there's actually potentially an opportunity there for a quality offering to be put together um, where you'd actually have more space and um, and kind of more like the offices that these big occupiers are moving out of rather than the kind of the co-working trend where everyone is kind of working at a shared desk and stuff. Now, rather than suffer from not only the loss of the rent that you're going to lose or the reduction of the rent, you're also looking at losing a tenant to a flex operator. And so rather than suffer those two losses, I see landlords starting to set up their own flex operations. So, uh, and, and certainly I've actually been looking at this myself. So rather than fitting out an office in the traditional sense and then looking for a tenant to come and take it for five or 10 years, we've actually run the ruler over setting it up and putting in the desks and furniture and everything and actually putting staff in there and actually running it like a co-working type space where people come in and rent desks and stuff. Now it is not without risk because it's got what I like to call execution risk. And it's much, much more like for, for a traditional landlord who would typically go and just rent and forget in the past, this has a lot of risks around it because we're not used to operating a space where it's, that's more like a, running a hotel or a leisure center or something like that. If you're operating a space, you're getting into client acquisition, you're getting into advertising, you're getting into all that stuff that we don't typically have to do. So there's definitely a risk there of spending the money on the fit out and doing all the furniture and stuff. And then afterwards, learning that you can't get the people in and you can't drive the kind of the accommodation. So this is definitely an area. And because of that, I actually think what we're probably going to see is an increase in the number of flex office experts or we'll say operators that actually provide it as a service to the landlord. Now, as you guys will know, WeWork was the first kind of big name out there to sort of set it all up. Well, actually, the first big name was Regis. And uh, WeWork made a big name for itself in this space. And they would rent the space and they would go and look for the tenants directly. But in this particular case, what we're talking about is we're talking about the landlord actually um, employing somebody to come in and actually run it as a service for them. So the landlord collects all of the benefits and it might be like a hotel management contract type thing. Now, I actually had a conversation with somebody who's in that space. If you go way back now to episode number 29 of the podcast, I spoke to a chap called Adam Blasky and Adam used to run a place called Clubhouse London and then he set up his own business and I think it's, it's called Productive Partners and he's in that space and he provides that whole consulting service to landlords. So it's worth going back and having a listen to that and I'm actually going to bring on another co-working operator soon to kind of just continue to have a conversation around this. Number two, and we are talking about ESG and sustainability or the whole green agenda. Now, I talked about ESG, specifically ESG, back on episode number 45. And I also had Nelly Reed more recently on the podcast, episode number 90. And this is an area that really I cannot emphasize enough. This is literally, at the moment, it is my highest priority in terms of educating myself in this whole space. Like, I've talked about it. And I can talk about it, you know, more than the average kind of person in this industry, but I don't know enough. And I recognize that and I'm very, very clear on that. Um, but I'm currently in the process of doing five buildings here in East Point. There's five buildings that 
are we'll say dated um they they're going back to the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s and those five buildings have to be brought up to certain standards in order to tick the boxes around esg and green and sustainability and all that so where can i start with this whole talk i mean literally this is an entire podcast on its own but i'll try and just kind of cover a couple of the things that i'm seeing within this trend itself climate change yes very very important but this goes way beyond the, the climate change thing. It's, this is not just being a good citizen and doing what you should be doing in terms of climate change. This is actually survival now in terms of you know, being a landlord and providing a service to big investors. You have to realize that all of these big investors are now super focused on this. And when I say super focused, they, they're literally, they've, they've started looking at very, very ambitious targets that they will achieve so much of their portfolio will be um, a certain level of certification, whether that's lead gold or whether that's Briam 97% or whatever it is. There's all these different ratings uh, for an energy, uh, for a building's energy performance rating and stuff. Um, 96% of Jones Lang LaSalle's global clients have set these very, very ambitious targets and they've made them public knowledge. So this is a reputational thing now. They need to tick the box because there's a huge risk of being accused of greenwashing. Now, greenwashing is one of those buzzwords that we might be hearing nowadays but what is it essentially when people started talking about esg and sustainability and all that people were going out there and they were you know slapping kind of a sign or a sticker on the window saying we are you know so much carbon neutral or all of these kind of stuff and if you're doing that if you're just all talk and no action if you're actually discovered to be using this as some sort of an advertisement or some sort of just using the whole kind of environmental sustainability as a kind of catchphrase or as a kind of advertising promotional thing for your business that is called greenwashing you have to be coming at this from a very authentic genuine place and really a target is no longer a nice to have you have got to achieve that target within the time frame that you talk about or there are serious ramifications now, I just read a recent headline in one of the papers, and it was that Salesforce have now tied their executive pay to ESG targets. And so this is really starting to catch on. Now, Salesforce, as you probably know, is a major, major tech company, one of the biggest in the world. And if they have started to tie their executive pay to ESG, you know it is very serious. And it's you're going to just watch the entire industry starting to pivot to taking particular attention, paying particular attention to this if executives' pay is now tied to it. Now, Salesforce is obviously, it's a big tenant or a big occupier in the buildings. They don't build these buildings and they don't, um, buy these buildings they rent these buildings and so they have to find a landlord to deliver them the kind of building that they have made all these promises about and so that is where the developers of these very very sustainable green buildings come along and it's going beyond now just literally handing over the building with all the bells and whistles like you've you know nowadays the energy performance of the building you put pv cells in the roof and there's all sorts of insulation and low flow taps for water and the toilets and the air quality and the ventilation and that is what it's all about but it's not just simply the landlord building that building and handing it over there's now things called green leases and what that is is that the lease puts an obligation on the tenant who is signing the lease that they also have to operate the building a certain way typically when we enter into a lease with a large occupier it is a long-term lease you know it might be 15 years or something like that and the tenant takes on full responsibility for all of the running of the building and the costs and all that kind of stuff and so they you could leave them to their own devices and think that's fine but the reality is is that you have to expect them to run the building in an efficient manner not to create lots of waste not to uh, you know use the systems inappropriately so that they um, are very high emission creators as well 
And so that's where the green lease is coming in. And, th and the reason this is all becoming so important is because the landlords are under the same kind of pressure reputationally because they are being scrutinized by the big investors that give them the money to build the buildings and to kind of lease the buildings. And so it is becoming this kind of, I won't call it a vicious circle because it's a good thing. So it's, I suppose it's a virtuous circle. But some of the big buzzwords that are coming out from this are things like there's, there's the green premium and there's the brown discount. Now, what that means is that the new green buildings that are coming out there are attracting premium rent and premium yields and premium prices, we'll say. Whereas older buildings, they call them brown, uh, as in they're pre-existing. Brown buildings or buildings that don't have all of that green bells and whistles, those buildings are attracting a discount now. And so at some point, older buildings are just not going to get the same rent. They're not going to get the same price. And so you're looking at your assets falling in value. And as the occupiers are looking to move into the new buildings, the landlords are you know, busy upgrading their buildings to try to compete. And obviously, if you can't compete with the new buildings, then you're just going to fall into this kind of secondary category and nobody wants to own a load of assets that are considered secondary. But there's an awful lot of confusion in the industry. And this is something that I can tell you myself. Um, you know, that 96% figure that I gave you a moment ago of the Jones Lang global clients, that they all have these really ambitious targets. But of those 96%, only 19% of them actually have clear plans and committed spending plans for all of this to do this work. And that is because they don't really know what to do. It is not clear what you have to do. And this is something that I've actually experienced myself lately. I brought in a lot of experts to a meeting. We were sitting down with these experts and we were saying like, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna actually like completely upgrade and refurbish and renovate this building so that it is very, very green and ticks all the boxes. And the guys really struggled to articulate what it was that we needed to do. I mean, there's a couple of things like, you know, change your air conditioning system from a gas uh, system to an electrical system and your heating from gas to electrical. That's obviously going to work a certain way. But they weren't clear on it all. And the big dilemma for, for me, for us, for the business I'm in, and for the industry in general as landlords, the big dilemma is that for all of this extra investment that you're putting in, there's often not a single penny uh, of increase in rent. So, for example, I'm looking at a building at the moment, and we're being told that if we spend 200000 we can bring it to a certain standard. But if we bring, if we spend say 600,000, we can go you know, to an even higher level above that. Now the difference between us spending 200,000 and 600,000 does not equate to one single euro of extra rent. And you might sort of say, well then, why would you bother doing the 600,000? You just go for the lower amount. But the reality is, is that you're putting yourself at risk of having an unrentable building in not too not too far away from now and the reason is is because the standards are constantly changing this is not a static thing and what you have at the moment is you have the the industry is it's it's constantly evolving and so what is considered a good energy rating today might be considered mediocre in two years time five years time and so there's another word that's starting to come out there and it's it's called a stranded asset it's another one of the buzzwords that I've been hearing. And what that is, is, is buildings that are not energy efficient, that, I don't, that are not green, that don't have all of these sustainability that is required. What's going to happen to them? So say, for example, you have a tenant in a building and they have eight years left on their lease. And that tenant is, it's a very, very important operation, we'll say. Let's say they have a 24-hour a day call center or something like that. They can't have a situation where the center goes offline. They can't have a situation where you decide, you know, all of you guys need to move home for a couple of weeks while we renovate the building. Those buildings, they can't be touched for the entire duration of the eight-year lease. And in the meantime, you might have investors that expect you to have your entire portfolio at a certain kind of environmental standard within, say, five years. If you're not able to upgrade that building 
inside that five years. So it's going to mean that your 100% of your portfolio is not at the level it needs to be. Well, then you're going to have to dump that building on the market. You're going to have to sell it and you're going to have to get it out of your portfolio or else you're not going to have achieved these ambitious targets. And so those are being called stranded assets. They're, going, they're basically assets that you cannot get in, you cannot do anything about. Now, of course, there's a potential opportunity there. If somebody is dumping a stranded asset, then it's going to be at a discount. Uh, you're going to be able to buy it at a discount. You'll probably get a good yield from the existing tenant. But the problem will be that when the tenant moves out, you're going to have to spend a fortune on bringing the building up to the standard. Now, if anyone's thinking that, come on, Gavin, you're over-exaggerating this, I can, I'm just telling you, this is not an exaggeration. This is so becoming such a focus of the industry now. And I had a conversation during the week with the facility manager for one of the big, big occupiers that I work with here in East Point. And he was telling me that it's like literally 100% of his focus is now on reducing the energy usage of the building. And they have all of these very, very strict kind of targets that they have to achieve. And he's just constantly studying their building management system, studying their utility bills, their, their emissions. Um, now, the focus up until day, this, this, this manager was telling me, the focus up until now has been on energy and getting everything you know, lower energy, reducing the energy that's being consumed by the building. But that is now going to be moving towards carbon emissions as being the main focus. And not just carbon emissions. The big buzzword I'm hearing these days is embodied carbon. Now, I know I talked about this with Nellie Reed back in episode 90, but this is huge. And when you wonder what embodied carbon is, embodied carbon is basically the amount of carbon that it took to create that building in the first place. And so it's look, you're looking at the life cycle of all of the materials that went into that building. So think about the steel and the glass and the concrete, all of that stuff. For example, most of the steel comes from mills that might be in China or on the other side of the world or wherever it is. That has to be those huge big steel bars and the, 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 the I-beams and columns and stuff. All of that gets shipped on a huge big boat and that boat is chugging across the you know the Atlantic Ocean or whatever it's wherever it's coming from it's going to be burning through millions and millions of gallons of oil and all of that goes towards creating carbon and the, the people are now the industry are starting to study all of this so the amount of carbon that went into not only making the steel but shipping the steel to site the amount of carbon that went into creating concrete to delivering sand to the amount of um, products that are delivered you know furniture that's delivered to site how much carbon was actually used in the production of that this is embodied carbon and so existing buildings out there have a certain value of embodied carbon and um, the industry now operational carbon is the other thing so the big occupiers they are currently all looking at the amount of air travel that they do and every single flight that the ceo goes on so if he flies from london to new york that flight you know emitted so much carbon and they have to offset that by paying a fine, basically, for the carbon. And so that's how you offset your carbon. And so you'll hear about this carbon offsets and stuff. And uh, Now, that was air travel. It is from 2023, this particular company is going to be looking at all car travel by their staff in a business context. So I'm not talking about coming from, you know, go, your commute in the morning. But if you're getting in your car and you're driving down the country to go and meet a client, that is the journey of so much burns so much uh, carbon and therefore you're going to have to offset that as well and for that reason all of these companies that have got a lot of people in cars like a fleet they're starting to move to fully electric car fleets and so it's certainly on post here in ireland the the, the post office they have moved to 100 um, percent electric fleet and when you have a 100% electric fleet, it means that you need to have a lot of the structures or the, uh, the facilities to be able to charge the fleet and all of that stuff. So that has a knock-on impact for the landlord. So look, there's like an entire industry growing up around this. 
and I have no doubt it will trickle down to smaller occupiers and then it'll trickle down into the residential sector. And the reason I say that is because the big investors are starting to invest in the residential sector. And so you're going to start seeing this across the board. And if you're buying property and you're not thinking about this, then you might be just a little bit short-sighted. I just, I do think there's going to be either taxes or there's going to be some incentive to make yourself more green in the coming years. And uh, anyway, enough on that. Let's get to number three. Number three is big data and the harvesting of information. Now, I'm not going to dwell too long on this one, but this is kind of tied to the previous one as well. Um, with so much focus on energy usage and the use of carbon and carbon emissions and things like that, you need big data to actually be able to go and process this information. Like it is too much for a person to get out a piece of paper and sort of try to kind of monitor all this. You need machines to do this for you. You need computers, you know, full time. It's basically a full time job for somebody with the help of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And when I was speaking to this facility uh, manager last week, he was telling me that they study their building management system very closely. They're looking for opportunities to improve their emissions and so they're looking at how often is the air conditioning system clicking on during the night when there's nobody in the building um, even things like water heaters that are in the bathrooms and stuff like that if they're switched on 24 hours it means they're boiling water or they're heating up the water in the middle of the night and so by putting things like the, them on timer switches that is actually reducing and it means that the thing is not heating water out of hours when it's unnecessary. All of this can be found by looking at the building management system and seeing the little sort of increases in usage of electricity and stuff. And so these things are being studied. Another thing, air, indoor air quality. Now, this is something that I actually talked about back in episode number 44. I brought a guy called Michael Grant from Metricus and Air Rated in to speak about indoor air quality. And this is an area that is also tied to wellness, which is going to be the next point that I cover. But if you look at it from a carbon emissions point of view, you have a ventilation system. You know, you've got air conditioning and you've got the exchange of air. And in order to have an office that is a productive workplace, you need to have the perfect balance of air. In the, If you have too much CO2 in the air, you start to get drowsy. If you're air conditioning is on too often you get too cold but if you let it heat up you get it gets too warm and people get drowsy again so it's a constant battle to try to get the correct level and that's where these indoor air quality sensors are starting to become used and indoor air quality sensors means that you can keep the air at an optimum level and it means that you can switch off your ventilation system and you can switch off your air conditioning until it's needed again and that way you just you reduce the amount of time that you're switching on your systems and switch them off and all this kind of stuff it's all part of it but you can't do that by you know standing next to the thing you need systems to do this so i do see uh, property technology and things like that coming in to do this kind of thing in the past you simply had your system on full blast and it would like throw out all this kind of uh, air changes per hour that are based on recommended levels not anymore the energy usage on that was just way too high and it's now very important for them to kind of monitor these little dips and and blips and just to understand the nuances and so there's a lot of prop tech a lot of sort of startups in this whole space starting to come along and i do think it's a big trend and there's a load of opportunities in that because just with the decarbonization of the real estate sector there's just going to be endless opportunities in this whole space number four wellness and that is the health and fitness now you guys who listen you know that i pay attention to my health and my fitness but this is at a corporate level so this is the businesses that actually rent the buildings are now trying to do it on behalf of all of their staff. Uh, I already mentioned indoor air quality. That's part of it. You know, the ability to breathe fresh air and all that kind of stuff. But I'm also seeing 
uh, being delivered to a lot of our offices around the place. I'm seeing gym equipment being delivered. And that is because they want to be able to provide, you know, in-house gyms and stuff. And that is partly for wellness and fitness and stuff, but it's also as people are thinking of coming back to the office from the work from home, they want to make to give them little bells and whistles, little kind of incentives to go into the office. Oh, there's a new gym in the office. That's going to be great. I'll go in and I'll use it. There's also, I'm seeing a big increase in the amount of people using bikes to come to work. Now, this again is linked to, you know, climate change and people trying to be do the right thing. But it used to be in the past that, you know, you had all of the kind of the junior staff cycling to the office and getting buses in and the, the executives, the top level managers, they'd all be coming in in their car. They'd arrive in a nice new executive car. They park in their car parking space and they were kind of like treated with a certain level of reverence because of their position in the company. That is changing now and executives arriving by bicycle because they want to set the example. And because of that, there's a big focus now on arriving by bike. It's no longer seen as something that the junior staff do exclusively. And because of that, you're see I'm seeing indoor bicycle racks. I'm seeing heated drying rooms. I'm seeing really, really high quality shower facilities. All of this stuff means that somebody who's cycling in is not going to feel like it's a secondary, secondary mode of transport, that the car would be better. They cycle in, they arrive, they can get their gear all dried by the end of the day. They've got secure indoor sort of racks so that they're not, the bike is not sitting outside in the rain. And they've got good changing facilities so that they don't feel like they're walking around in sweaty clothes or whatever. And it's all part of this battle to recruit and retain talent. And that is the, the, the war on talent that has been kind of the focus of a lot of these big tech companies. There is a thing called the Well Certificate. And that is an actual, there's a, there's a business in, a, in the US called, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but it's the Wellness Center for Wellness or something like that. And they produce this thing called the Well Certificate. And you can now go out and you can get your building certified as being a certain level of well. And that includes things like food quality that is on offer in the staff canteen and it's down to the amount of green planting that's uh, that's there that can be touched and felt that's called biophilia it's around the gyms and thing even spaces for meditation and things like yoga all of this is becoming a thing and now with work from home people are trying the employers have to offer this kind of incentive for you to come back to the office and so they're offering this choice and that is kind of tied in also to the flex space and the ESG uh, points that I made uh, earlier. In ESG, the E stands for environmental, but the S stands for social. And so you're talking about social interaction. You're talking about the care of, communi of the community, the impact on the community. And so all of this is tied into what these um, big occupiers are trying to kind of offer their staff. Uh, I'm currently being approached by companies that offer sort of fitness uh, services to their occup to occupiers, and so they, they you know they can have things like they will organise football games, and they'll organise like um, weekly tennis tournaments and things like that, and they'll do all of the work for you, and in return for that they get paid fees by these big companies. There's also you know healthy lifestyle awareness there's people that come in and they train up the staff now it used to be that this was something that you would do yourself but now it's been done on a corporate level where the business is actually hiring people at you know to come in and basically train their staff on healthy options and stuff so this is something that i'm seeing a lot of and it does seem to be a trend that the industry is moving towards and then finally i'm going to bring you through to the um the residential HMO sector. I, may, I did mention that I'm going to bring in something from the residential, and this is something that all listeners can kind of participate in. And the reason that I'm really focused on it is because it is due to the supply-demand imbalances out there. Now, just in the most recent podcasts that I've been doing, I've been talking about supply chain, supply imbalances, but the creation of HMO assets, um, it's not just here in my home market. Um, but that is a massive opportunity. But it, what, it, what you do when you create a HMO asset, you're taking a big 
um, house and you're dividing it into smaller units and you're renting out those units. And by doing that, you're getting a much, much higher yield um, in terms of an investment return. But you're also increasing the amount of space that's on the market. Um, you're, you're increasing the amount of units that somebody can rent um, that are available on the market. Now, HMO, uh, the, the whole concept of a HMO has been around for a long time. In the UK, it's regulated. Everybody who's listening to this from the UK will know about HMOs. And not everybody likes the idea of owning a HMO because there's, there's certainly more operationally involved in it. It's not very well known here in Ireland, but certainly um, it's not regulated yet here in Ireland. And that brings with it both opportunities and some risks. Um, certainly the, the mastermind clients that I have have done quite a few HMOs and like they were getting 15 to 20% yields on their investment. And, you know, there's other people going out there doing buy to let and they're getting, you know, five or 6% return. 15 to 20% from a HMO makes it much, much more attractive, but definitely more involved in terms of operations. Now, it's not straightforward here in the Irish market, I should say, it's not straightforward from a valuation point of view because it is not regulated. People that are coming in to value your property do not look at it like um, and sort of say, OK, it's a it's a five better HMO. They look at it as just an existing property and they look at the comparisons with other properties in that area. And because of that, you just have to be careful that you can get the value that you need in order to be able to refinance this property or whatever. Like one of the opportunities that I see is after the pandemic of the last two years and the way travel was interrupted, there's possibly a lot of people out there that have decided to give up on you know, running a, a bed and breakfast or something like that, or Airbnb or whatever it is. There's opportunities perhaps to go out there and buy those kind of properties and convert them into larger HMOs. And you know, if you have an eight to 10 bedroom HMO, you can actually have a very, very strong return of investment. You can double your rent effectively on the asset that is sitting there. And also what it does is it reduces the chance of you having uh, rental voids. Voids are when the tenant moves out. And if you have one property rented to one tenant and the tenant moves out, you've lost 100% of your income. If you have a property rented to five tenants and one tenant moves out, you've only lost 20% of your income. So there is a benefit there from that. Um, why do I think this is a big opportunity? Well, I see it coming from two primary reasons. The number one is because of inflation. Um, inflation has driven up the cost of living. We've seen it in our shopping. You know, if you go and get your weekly shop up, you'll have seen an increase in the cost. If you're going to fuel your car, you're going to see an increase. And if you're paying for, you know, electricity or gas bills or whatever at your house, they've gone up. Netflix has gone up. Like pretty much everything has gone up in the last while. And because of that, the amount of money that you had in your pocket has been reduced. And instead of having, you know, whatever it is, 2000 in your pocket at the end of every month, you now have 1800, 1700, we'll say. Um, the, the, you know, the little bites that have been taken out here and there by the increase in costs, they have reduced the amount that you actually have in your pocket. And because of that reduction, you can't afford the same rent or you can't afford to pay the same mortgage as before. So affordability is, is a big impact. And I do think because of that, with so many people impacted by this, and already there's just this such a demand for property out there that rents have been going up, I think having the option of smaller units that are sort of smaller rental amounts. So instead of looking for 2,000 for a house, you go out there and you look for 650 for a room. And people can go and they can save money if they're paying 650 a month, as opposed to trying to kind of scramble together to get all that money together. Um, the other big one is, the other big reason I see, is just that demand is so high. The pandemic has slowed the amount of supply to the market. It's reduced it or cut it all together. And because of that, you know, the demand is already pretty high. But on top of that now, the Ukrainian crisis, and I spoke about that just this, just two episodes ago, back in 98, uh, episode 98, 
The Ukrainian crisis now, we have 3.2 million refugees have, uh, have left, have fleed the, kind of the, the war in Ukraine. And that's in just three weeks. So those 3 million people are looking for somewhere to stay. Now, how long would it last? It's completely unknown. This could go on for another year, two years. I mean, if you look at Syria, Syria went on for nearly a decade. Um, it's hard to sort of see it going on for that long, but that is potentially what's going to happen. Now, if it's three million after just three weeks of war, what will it be like in a month or two? Like, could we be looking at four or five million, 10 million refugees? Uh, Ireland has already agreed to take 100,000 refugees. But like, where are they going to live? Where are they going? Now, I know that the people that are coming, the refugees that are coming to Ireland, are they're going to stay with family. That's the reason they're choosing Ireland, is because they've got family or friends here. Um, but staying in somebody's house, staying with family, that can often only be a temporary solution, either because you've got not enough space to, to put people up for long term, or um, it just becomes difficult to live with. You know, if you've ever had somebody, you know, come and stay with you for a couple of weeks, it becomes difficult after a period of time. The, you know, the initial, you know, fun of it is soon lost. It certainly has been on me in the past. Uh, so a long-term solution for this is going to be for an awful lot more properties to be needed. And if it's, uh, some of these people are, you know, they're well-educated people. They are going to assimilate into the economy. They're going to get jobs. And when they get jobs, they're going to want to rent their own place. And so there's going to be more and more property required. And if we have 100,000 refugees coming into our country, our small country, with already a housing crisis, you can see what that's going to do. So I do think it is going to put the pressure on the housing supply. It's going to make it really, really important um, to get the housing market um, performing more and I can I can see construction industry opportunities around that but I, I think it not only is going to push up prices I also think it's going to create demand for these lower rent options and that is why I think the HMO thing is going to be a big one and that's not just here in Ireland it's going to be across Europe it's going to be in the UK although it's a regulated market and um, I think it's just here in the Irish market it's absolutely acute and, um, and so I do think that that is an opportunity or certainly, you know, providing cheaper accommodation opportunities for people. All right, guys, hope you found this useful. That's the show. Hey, guys, it's me again. Just before you go, I want to ask you a quick favor. Can you just take a moment to leave a review for the podcast over on iTunes or wherever you listen? Also, if you have any questions or topics that you'd like me to cover in future episodes, please leave a comment below. If you're looking on YouTube, just leave a comment down below. Or if you are listening to on the podcast, you know, send me a DM. Uh, connect with me via my Facebook group that is called Behind the Facade Community. Alternatively, just you know, find me on social media. My handle is Gavin J. Gallagher. And before I go, don't forget to check out that new property investor readiness test link is in the show notes below and finally you can could consider joining my tribe you can do that by heading over to my website gavinjgallagher.com all right guys go do something awesome this week and i'll catch you here next week mm -hmm.